Welcome everyone to CSE 611. If you're in the wrong room, just give it like a five Mississippi and then just you can discreetly leave and no one will notice. All right. um, hopefully you all have a syllabus. Um, I'm going to start out and go through the syllabus. Okay. Um, okay, so at the top we've got the catalog description. Uh, and then we have meetings, meeting time and location. So Mondays we're going to meet in this room. Whole class will meet here. And then about half the class will have their lab session on Tuesday at the same time. And the other half will be in the lab Wednesday at the same time. And this depends on which section you signed up for. We have a TA assigned to each lab. So the Tuesday lab is Charles, who's sitting right there. And the Wednesday lab uh, will be covered by Rasha, another one of my PhD students. And the lab location is Swear Engine 3D 22. That's the, the, the recently refurbished lab on the third floor, uh, D Wing. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping. I like that. Which is good. That's good. Hoping they can. I'm going to start. Yeah, I'm going to start complaining about that, though. It's like a meat locker in there. A little, it's a little chilly. Yeah. Uh, the web page is, I'm using uh, Moodle, dropbox.csc.sc.edu. I'm not using Blackboard, so I'm going to post everything on there. The textbook is this one, Digital Design and Computer Architecture. It's a required text, but uh, if you don't want to buy it, it's available online free if you just search for the title. Right, it's the first search result, right, Charles? That is what we found. Very <laughs> uh, This is... Now, we're going we're to be learning a new language in this class, System Verilog, and this, this book will be a, a good reference for that. Of course, you know, you can also, there's a lot, a lot of stuff on Verilog online as well. Uh, so we've got the course learning outcomes here. These are the official ABET learning outcomes. Um, first one is to, is to perform HDL design. That's the Verilog language I just mentioned. Uh, the second is to do is to be able to perform simulation and verification of large-scale digital systems. We're also going to cover the design of microarchitectures. You might say, "Wait a minute, we already did that in 212." Yeah, but we're actually going to build them and, and use them now. 212, you you learn the concepts of microarchitecture and, and you looked at block diagrams. But we're actually going to build a CPU in this class. Uh, number four is design interconnects. Uh, just how different modules communicate using standard protocols. And number five is logic synthesis, which is this idea of taking a program written in an HDL and converting it into a, a circuit, a bunch of interconnected gates. And moving on to the second page, I've got some important dates. Uh, the withdrawal date is November 6th. Last lecture is December 2nd. Uh, the last lab is going to be that week, Tuesday and Wednesday of, of the same week as the last lecture. Uh, we're going to have a project cutoff of December 7th. You've got to get all your projects turned in by then for, for credit. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The final exam is scheduled for Monday, December 9th. I think, I think that's the right time. Oh, that should say 4 to 6 30. Um, this class does not, if you go to the final exam schedule, you're not going to find an exact match for how this course is organized in there. Uh, but the closest one I could find was, I think, Monday, Wednesday, 3.55. Uh, so so the, the time is, uh, is going to be, um, for that, is, is, is uh, sorry, December 9th. If anyone has a conflict, though, because of the, I, I shouldn't, no one can have a conflict, right? Because you can't be taking another class Monday, Wednesday at 3.55. So it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, lecture is canceled next Monday. Uh, because of Labor Day, and also it will be canceled November 18th when Charles and I are, are away at a conference at Supercomputing. Uh, the lab will be canceled this week and next week, so you won't come to lab uh, until um, the week of September uh, 9th. Make sense? So don't come to lab this week or next week. And then lab is going to be canceled November 26th because we're closed the, the 27th, 28th, and 29th. So the Wednesday lab is canceled, so we'll just cancel the, 
the Tuesday lab as well, but I will lecture during that week, the week of Thanksgiving. Make sense? Okay. I remember to fix that typo there. Uh, my contact information is here. I'm in the uh, Innovation Center, IBM building, Story, I don't know what it's called anymore, but um, it's the one on Blossom and Assembly. Uh, room 2213. Charles and Rasha are also in that same building in room 2236. That's my research lab. They have desks in the research lab. Um, Charles's office hours will be Monday, Wednesday, 2 to 3.30, and Rasha's will be Tuesday, Thursday, 12 to 1.30. It doesn't matter what lab you're in, you can go to either TA for help. So if you can't make one office hour, you can, you're, you're welcome to go to the other, the other TA. Um, We've thought about having all the office hours meet in the lab as opposed to the, the story building. Like, so have them meet in Swearingen as opposed to the story building. Um, have we decided on that yet? Or maybe we'll, 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 now, we'll probably announce when we're going to have office hours in the, the teaching lab as opposed to the research lab up in, in uh, story. Probably the way we'll do it is uh, the, the week before the project is due, right? We'll be, we'll be in office hours in Swearingen because that's easier because you just come to the same lab that you would go to normally for lab and then everything's set up and all the boards are there. So it's, it's easier for the TAs to help you out. Yeah, makes sense? If you had more than one or two people in office hours, it's not a, not a fun time for, for anyone involved. Yeah, because the, the, your files are on the departmental file server, which is a little difficult to access. You have to set up like an SSH uh, FS mount and then the boards and... Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> it's tough. So we'll we'll just meet mostly in the labs. Uh, okay, so the grading this this course is going to be graded um, a little bit differently than the other course you've had before. Uh, most of the grades are going to come from six or possibly seven projects, depending on uh, whether you're taking the course for undergraduate or graduate credit. As far as I can tell, there's out of 34 students enrolled, four are taking it for graduate credit that I know of, maybe, f actually there's five because I remember assigning someone's accelerated master's form. And if, oh, is that you? Okay. And if anyone's um, taking this for honors credit, uh, you'll also need to do that seventh project. But most of us, will, most of you will be doing six projects. Uh, these projects uh, build on top of one another. So you have to complete lab three before you can start working on lab four. Okay, because the idea is that we're gonna we're going to incrementally build up a fully working CPU, but we can't do all that in one lab because CPUs are complex. So we're gonna build them up little by little. We're gonna be doing sort of a bottom-up design of the CPU. Um, so because the graduate students and, and honor students have an extra lab, the the weights are a little different. Um, but the weights are shown here for undergraduate students in this column. We'll have uh, two midterms and a final. Um, now, I've got this thing where we're going to omit uh, lab six or one of the two midterms depending on which one of those scores has the most negative impact on your, on your, on your grade, on your final calculated grade. In other words, we're essentially dropping the lowest score of those three. That means you have to take the final, uh, but you can you know, miss uh, one of the two midterms, or you can just have a bad day and not do well on one of the midterms. Or uh, lab six, I mentioned that the labs build on one another. Okay, So if you get behind for you know, any reason, you get busy with other things, and you get behind on these labs, there's sort of a snowball effect that happens because with every lab, if you, get, if you get behind sort of in the middle or at the beginning of the semester, you will increasingly get behind as the semester goes along. And so if that happens and you, and you can't finish lab six, you don't get the final lab done, then that can be one of the grades that you can drop, right? So that way we avoid uh, completely uh, tanking your grade because you, you got behind. Yes? Is this drop individualized or is it it's individualized, yeah, yeah. And then, so if we do, when we drop, now you might say, well, how are you going to drop that? Because they have different weights. I mean, the midterms are 10% and the final lab there is 15%. We're going to re-weight everything based on, you know, the, 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 the weights of the remaining 
uh, score. So I have an example there. Um, if midterm two is dropped, um, the weight of lab six in the final exam, oh, oh actually, uh, oh, screw that up too. This was back when we were allowing the final exam to be dropped. Okay, so forget that. <laughs> I'll fix that. Um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll reweight everything according to the original weights when we drop one of the scores because you'll notice that these actually, these, these add up to 100. So we have to reweight everything, renormalize everything. Okay, when we drop a score. Yes? Yes, yeah, yeah, the finals cumulus. That's why we don't want you to uh, drop. In the past, when I've allowed students to drop the final, then, you know, half the class um, just exempts out of the final. And the problem with that is if you look at the schedule, the last uh, two weeks of the class were just covering concepts more than the applied stuff. So I don't want to lose every, you know, lose half the class three weeks before the semester ends. So the final is is required for that reason. Uh, so I think we've got this covered pretty well. In the past, we've had a problem with students getting behind, and then, you know, that was an issue. I think hopefully this, have, being able to drop lab six solves that. And, you know, there's always cases where you either forget to come or you miss a midterm or you just do badly on a midterm. Uh, and so we'll be dropping that. And then the final is cumulative. So I think we're pretty well covered there. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, I've got a schedule here. We have to stick close to this schedule or we're not going to get done. We're not going to get the CPU completed. And also, we only have, we have 15 weeks, but we've got um, Memorial Day next Monday being, being canceled, which wipes out the corresponding labs. And then we've got that conference. Uh, so I think we only have 13 lectures and, you know, 13 labs or so. Um, so we're on a pretty tight schedule. Each lab will have about two weeks to, to do. I've got it planned out where generally I'll lecture on what you need to do to do the lab the week before the lab is assigned and then you'll have two weeks to do it. The exceptions there are lab one is only one week and lab six you're going to have th three weeks. Right, but generally speaking it's two weeks per lab. Uh, in this class, in, in case you you might have spoken to others who have taken this class in the past, we, we're changing up the way we do it. We used to just do the labs. And then last fall, I taught it just as a regular class, just purely lecture, no labs, just all conceptual stuff. Uh, and then this time we're doing as a hybrid approach where I'm going to try to balance the class out to where it's about half applied stuff where you know, I'm teaching you what you need to do to, to make a CPU on an FPGA. And the other half is going to be concepts, stuff that you aren't going to necessarily use in lab, but conceptual stuff that you need to be able to know for the exams, right? So I'm, I'm going to try to balance it out, half applied, half conceptual. Hopefully it works out. Hopefully I, I don't run out of time. My biggest fear is I won't have enough time to fit all that in, because there's a, there's a lot of material. Um, OK, if, uh, if you have a documented disability, contact Disability Services. The syllabus. Uh, might change if if we have a cancellation because of a hurricane or something like that that's going to torpedo my plans uh, pretty badly and we may probably end up dropping a lab or, or something or maybe we'll drop a midterm I don't know but the, the so we may change the syllabus but hopefully everything goes well and I'm able to stick to this plan um, I've got a section here electronic resources so the first, the first item here says that everything you need for this class in terms of information is available on Moodle. I don't use Drop, uh, sorry, I don't use Blackboard. I use Moodle Dropbox. Uh, make sure that you're getting emails sent from Moodle. Make sure you monitor or forward your email.sc.edu because if there's a project extension or anything like that, I, I send it out over email. We're going to be using uh, software uh, that is licensed, uh, meaning that you have to use the software in the lab. And we also have these boards that we're going to be using to test out your designs, which um, these, these live in the lab as well. Uh, so what that means, unfortunately, is there's not a whole lot of work you can do at home um, outside the lab, although if you, if you talk to... Yeah, if you talk to Charles and I, or if you have a, if if you know if you're if you're if you're comfortable with Linux, then you can do some stuff remotely, uh, but you won't be able to test the designs on the board remotely. 
Uh, so that's, like I said, that's available in 3D22. Uh, you can also use the software in 1D43 as well, but the boards will be in 3D22. Um, please don't remove any of those boards or any of their cables or power supplies. You don't have to put them away. Most people just leave them on the desks in the lab. That's fine. You don't have to put them, you don't have to worry about packing them away in the, in the cabinet or anything before you leave. You can just leave them out, but just leave them in the lab. Um, I think number four I mentioned, oh yes, and we're going to do two member project teams in this class. Uh, both members of each team get the same grade for all the projects, meaning that, I forget how it breaks down, but roughly what 65, 70% of your grade is going to be uh, shared between you and your group partner and you know, 70, 30 or 40% is an individual grade from the midterms and exam. Uh, and that can change, obviously, depending on whether you drop lab six or you drop one of the midterms, right, um, for your lowest score that you're going to drop. Um, but we're hoping that both partners in each team equally contribute to the labs. Um, however, in practice, it's, it's, it's not really feasible for there always to be a total total equal contribution. Usually one person likes to uh, be the member that kind of drives, types, clicks, that kind of stuff, and the other team member kind of sits and watches. But uh, I encourage you to try to at least have both members you know, know what's going on with your design, okay? Because otherwise you're not going to get everything you can out of this course. I've got the grading scale here, so there's no confusion there. I do, um, I grade on the um, 90 to 100 is an A, 85 to 90 is B plus, 80 to 85 is a B, and, and so on. I think that's become sta pretty standard over recently. Here we've got the academic honesty policy. This is a little, um, uh, it's a little confusing in this class. Um, each member of a project team obviously work very closely together. So you guys are going to be sharing, hopefully you're sharing design files. Hopefully you guys set up a Git repository or you know you have a Dropbox, shared Dropbox folder or you have a shared thumb drive or whatever. You're going to be sharing, a lot of, a lot of groups actually one member gives the other uh, his um, login credentials which obviously is not ideal but in practice that's usually what happens with most groups. So you're going to be working closely uh, in the teams, right? Um, we don't want you to share code or designs between teams right now. You know, it's, there's going to be a temptation to do that because you guys are all going to be sitting in the same lab working on it and you're going to be sitting next to another group who's working on their design. Uh, please don't do that. However, the CAD tools that we're using in this class are industrial CAD tools. They're not designed for students to use. They're designed for professionals to use in Silicon Valley. Um, they're designed with an emphasis on functionality and not an emphasis on usability, right? So the, the design tools that we use employ algorithms that are astronomically complex because literally you're taking a uh, high level language and you're going through multiple steps to, to synthesize it down to a gate level representation and then you have to take those gates and place them and route them on an FPGA, a programmable logic chip, that is indescribably complex. It's it's and it takes it, it's a lot of code in there, and it's all jealously guarded secrets on how it works. It's all trade secrets. Um, but that is the part. Oh, not only that, but they have to. Th these companies have to be able to create back ends to support thousands of different devices because every there's there's thousands of FPGA devices, and they all require a different way to do the synthesis place and route, you know, when you, when you target them, when you compile your design to them. So for that reason, like if you were to download these tools at home, it's like a 30 gigabyte download and most of that is in the technology libraries to support all of the different devices, right? Um, and you know, they're written by engineers uh, and they're, you know, they're generally not documented well. I mean, they don't hold your hand. It's not like using Microsoft Word. These are, um, uh, these are, you know, there, there's a presumption there that 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 uh, that you can handle these tools. So, 
Um, they're hard to use. So a lot of groups like to talk to other groups to, to, to share hints and tricks and, oh, it crashed with this message, I don't know what it means, and that kind of stuff. So we encourage you to help each other out when it comes to dealing with the, with the tools. Just don't share um, uh, designs, right? That kind of stuff. Yes? Sure. Yeah. 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 I'm fine with that. I mean, if you can have a conversation about, you know, where you're insul inserting stalls in the pipeline and that kind of stuff, because because if the because I think that's a good learning experience, right? Just don't share any code, and and don't use code from past semesters. Obviously, as you might, you know, that's happened. But we're running. We 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 always catch those because we have all the, um, you know, the submissions from the past, and we run them all through Moss. Yes. Oh. Philip, is that you? Oh. Obviously, stuff that we give you is going to be 100% match in that we won't ding you for. And there's certain things that everyone's going to design the same way because of how they are, and that's fine. But there were a lot of aspects of it that we would expect to vary group to group and does. And if it doesn't, then that's a concern. It's happened before. So yeah. there will be, that is something we're checking for. You can't trick Moss. Yeah, it's almost You're guaranteed right. at that point. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can if you can trick Moss. Um, go ahead, write out a class. Go write it. Go publish a paper. <laughs> yeah. You know. Okay, so that's that's the academic. Um, just use your best judgment there. Uh, if you have any questions, obviously feel free to ask us. Uh, attendance in lecture and labs is is is, uh, is optional, but um, highly encouraged. The lec I, I post all my lectures on YouTube, uh, including this one. I usually have them up within. Um, 24 hours of giving the lecture. I just, I put a link to my uh, YouTube channel on Dropbox. I can't inline the videos for some reason. Moodle um, screws it up. But, um, but, I, but I just have a link and then you go there and then you know, all, the, all the lectures are there. So if you miss a lecture, not a big deal. You can watch it online. Assuming, of course, I don't have a microphone failure or something and lose it. Um, the, the labs, um, the reason we have lab time is so you're guaranteed to be in there with a TA. Um, however, keep in mind that it's almost certainly going to take you a lot longer than the 200 minutes or so you're going to be allocated per project in the lab, right? Meaning that you're going to have to go to the lab outside of um, the, the, the scheduled times. Now that could be during you know office hours if if you know if, if that's if that's uh, that's one approach, or you know anytime you're free, uh, I recommend that you um, try to get in the labs and start the projects a little earlier. That way, when you're in the labs, you you'll have gotten into the project a little bit. And you'll be you'll be ready to ask questions. Okay, that makes sense. Um, the TAs are going to be in the lab. They're going to be just walking around answering questions and, and giving out you know hints and. Um, um, mostly helping out with the tools, as, as I mentioned earlier. Yes? Do you have some kind of, I guess, good like, indication for us? If you're saying it's going to take more than the time allotted across the two weeks, how much more we should expect? It, it varies quite a bit by group. Um, it, 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 a lot of it depends on uh, how comfortable you are with programming, um, honestly, and also just getting around in Linux. Where the labs are Linux labs. and. Um, you know, and it just depends on your your background, you know, personality, it, that kind of stuff. It's hard to it's hard to. I I don't think we can answer that any better. It, I would I would guess maybe roughly double the time. I think would be a good estimate of that. But just to give you an idea, though, um, the 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 actual number of lines of code you're going to write for a project is going to be small compared to what you did in say 240, yeah. right? Uh, because these are um, pretty lean and mean little programs that design hardware, so it's it's hard programming, but it's not a lot of lot. It's not it's not like it's We're taking a long time. Than yeah, I mean it's going to be what two or three hundred, a couple hundred lines of code at most that you'll never write any more than that per, per uh, assignment. Per assignment, yeah. yeah. I think the largest final submission to the graduate project that I ever saw was I think four thousand lines, including comments. And so that was a whole semester worth of work because it's all cumulative. So yeah, and they all build too. Keep that in mind as well. Like he mentioned, yeah, they they you, you build a, a register file in one lab and then you use it in the next lab, yeah. right? So, so that's kind of the idea. Okay, so um, so we also have a because of the the earlier problem I mentioned with the fact that the labs build on one another, we have a, a pretty um, 
lenient late policy. Uh, to get full credit, you have to submit your project on Dropbox by 11.59, the date it's due. But um, for every 24 hours of school days, which don't include weekends and holidays, uh, that you're late, uh, you're only penalized 7.5%. And even then, it's capped at 30%. So you'll never lose any more than 30% late penalty. So some groups have not really done anything until the end of the semester, and they kind of did all the labs one right after another and submitted them all in batch um, on, on reading day or whenever they were due at the end of the semester. And they only, they only lose, uh, you can only lose 30% for those. Uh, the late penalty is also is deducted from the raw score, right? So if you have an 80% raw score and it's one day late, then you'd be multiplying that by 92.5%. So you'd have a 74, right? So it's not, it's not taking 7.5% you know, off it's the top. It's just it's multiplied by the raw score. So the lower the raw score is, the less you know, absolute penalty points you get, <laughs> if that makes sense. OK, this syllabus was, yeah, I updated this today. I'll make a few more updates, tweak some typos and stuff. But this is. Um, this is uh, more or less it. Any questions? Yes? For the graduates, is there no like, in-class lab meetings for that? Um, I, let's see. I, how do I normally do that? I usually give like a private lecture for the, for the grad students on that one. It's, it's not long, though. Um, basically, uh, the, la the, the idea is to take the CPU that we design in this class and we want to be able to execute more than one instruction per cycle. So we convert it into a VLIW, very long instruction word. And so it's really just taking your existing lab and, and replicating certain components in order to, to execute two instructions at one time. There's a little bit of logic you have to put in there to detect dependencies. Um, uh, and then, yeah, and that's it. So it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward once you've gotten to that point. OK, um, so. I, I am going to begin the lecture. Oh, one other thing. The, um, I should have put this on the syllabus. There, the, there's a combination lock on the 3D22 lab. And the combination is 51243. Usually during class, the door will be propped open. But if you come in outside of class hours, you're going to have to put that combination in. Uh, oh, if you come to my office hours and I'm not there, check his office. Sometimes I'm in his office talking. Yeah, my office is kind of catty corner of the lab. So it's 2213 versus 2236. <coughs> OK, so I'm going to begin the lecture. So this lecture, I'm just going to motivate and introduce some things, try to get everyone pumped up. Um, oh, by the way, Dropbox right now is not populated because I've got three sections of this class on Dropbox. And Ryan is going to merge them all into one section after today. So you can expect these lecture slides and the video and everything will be on Dropbox. Uh, starting tomorrow or Wednesday. Okay, so if you log in right now, you're not going to see anything. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to begin the lecture uh, with a an argument that uh, Charles thinks is an inappropriate argument to make, but I'm going to make it anyway. <laughs> he hates it when I say this, but um, it's true. Um, why uh, why study hardware design? Several of my colleagues, as well as possibly some of your family members and maybe even some of you, uh, might regard hardware design as a kind of a, you know, or, or, or understanding how a, a chip processor works internally under the hood, uh, might regard that as kind of just an intellectual curiosity as opposed to something that is practical. And because it's, it's kind of true in, that, in the sense that if you look at the job market, there are thousands or tens of thousand times more jobs in software development than there is in hardware development, right? Hardware design jobs, if you get a job doing what we're doing in this class, you're going to be making a lot of money. And you're most definitely not going to be living in South Carolina, right? <laughs> and, and in fact, the, the mission of this university is to train our students to work in South Carolina as, as, a, state, as a state university. So, in a way, we're sort of, you know, sort of going against the mission of the university by teaching this stuff because there are no hardware design jobs in South Carolina. There used to be, uh, up until recently, Intel had a had a big office here, but they 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 closed it. Um, so you know, hardware designs hardware design jobs are more specialized, and they, but they pay a lot more. So this is the kind of job that you should be hoping for as a computer engineer, right? Although you may not end up doing it. 
Uh, I always call this class the quintessential computer engineering class, and if you don't love this class, then you're probably in the wrong major. But you might say, well, it's kind of late to say that now. We're seniors. Yeah, but that's okay because with a computer engineering degree, you can always get a job programming, right? That's kind of a superset. If you can design hardware, you can certainly design software, right? Um, so, so this sort of, when people, like in my colleagues, you know, talk about this stuff, they say, well, you know, the most powerful supercomputing on Earth right now is this computer, it has, you know, the big computers have names. They have like, their individual computers have names. This one's called the Summit Supercomputer. It's in Tennessee. It's the fastest computer in the world at the moment, although it may get, eventually get uh, displaced. Um, it's got two and a half million processor cores, three petabytes of RAM. It's got a peak floating point throughput of 200 petaflops per second, and it uses 10 megawatts to turn on. Um, and then, arguably, the smallest computer on Earth right now is an AT Mega 328 uh, processor. It's an 8-bit CPU. It's got 32 kilobytes of flash. It does 200 kiloflops per second and uses 20 milliwatts to turn on. There is no problem, no computational problem that can be solved by this computer that can't be solved by this computer. They can all run exactly the same programs and do exactly the same things and solve exactly the same problems. So in that sense, they are equivalent, right? Um, so, you know, why do we care? Well, it's kind of interesting because the ability to solve problems is not the same as the capability of the computer. And, you know, back in the day when, when we said capabilities, people just thought, well, how fast is the computer? But now capabilities have changed because up until 2014, there was no consumer, there was no commercially available car that could drive itself until the Tesla Autopilot came out in 2014. And up until 2015, it was impossible to do 4K video encoding on a phone. Uh, up until 2017, it was impossible to do three-dimensional facial ID on a phone. Up until 2017, it was impossible to do animojis. There's just not, no way to do it. It was science fiction. And in, until 2018, there wasn't any widespread use of computational photography, which is where you take a picture and it blurs the background artificially for you, right? So these are all capabilities that didn't exist before these dates. And why? Well, it had to do with the hardware, the hardware efficiency, the hardware speed, right? Uh, and also, the other part to this is um, when I was a kid, when I was growing up in the 90s, every computer had this button on the front that was labeled turbo. I bet none of you have seen this. So, so like at night, right, the turbo boost. Right. Oh my gosh. So what do you think the turbo button did? Nope. Nope. Made the fan blow horizontally. Nope. Didn't do any of that. The turbo button ran the computer at its native speed. If you turned off the turbo button, it would cripple the machine. And the reason for that was because every time a new computer came out in the 90s, it would be so much faster than the previous generation that it would break all the software. Like if you had, and I had this happen, I, my, favorite game, my favorite game was Chuck Yeager's Advanced Flight Trainer. And it was a, it was a really nice flight simulator program. And it ran fine on an 8086, and when the 286 came out, you would load that game on it, and it would be so fast it was unplayable. It was just, it was, it was, it was because it was, the performance of that game was linked to the processor speed, and the CPUs, every generation of CPU would be like four times the speed of the previous. So the turbo button, literally, if you turn it on, it would just run it at normal speed. Turn it off, and it would, it would downclock it severely. But you had to have this turbo button on every computer because otherwise half, most of the software wouldn't, that you'd put on it wouldn't work if you bought a new computer. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, um, these days there's no turbo button anymore. Why'd they get rid of it? Well, the reason is because um, if you look at, for example, the last 10 years of CPUs, these are Intel desktops, so in <coughs> server CPUs are different. Embedded CPUs are different, but if you just look at the Intel desktop, these are the ones you buy at Best Buy, over the past 10 years, from the Westmere to the Coffee Lake, um, you can see that the technology is still improving at a rate of increasing the number of transistors 
by about 20% every year, right? Which doubles the number of transistors every four years. Now, Moore's law was about doing, the, you know, the Moore's law said the number of transistors doubled every 18 months to two years, and that's no longer the case. But they're still doubling every four years or so. But if you look at any of the indicators of peak performance, these are all upper bounds, how, you know, the sort of the, the best the processor could be, as indicated by the clock speed, the instructions per cycle, the number of cores, the DRAM, the memory bandwidth, the floating point throughput, level three cache. None of these in, in, improve at the same rate as the number of transistors is improving, except the only, the only one that seems to match that is this single precision floating point performance. I don't know how much that's gonna last. But everything else is doubling, like for example, the number of in instructions per per core, the inst instructions per cycle that the processors can execute is doubling every 10 years at this point, right? So what this indicates is that CPUs are not, <coughs> are not speeding up at the same rate as we're adding stuff into them, right? Now that used to be the case, it's no longer the case. Well, why is that? Well, you can figure this out if you look at a picture of the CPU. Intel is one of the few companies this is one thing that Intel does right. Every time they come out with a new CPU, they make, they, they take a, a micrograph, a photograph of it over under a microscope, and then they also annotate the photograph with little boxes showing, because it's impossible to tell, well not impossible, but it's kind of hard to tell what's on a chip if you just take a picture of it. But Intel does this thing where they mark what's on there. And they do this with every processor. And Apple doesn't do this, and Samsung doesn't do this, and no one else does this but, but Intel for some reason. Intel is usually secretive and greedy about other stuff, but they're very open about this. And if you look at, for example, this is a picture of um, the Westmere CPU, which is about 10 years old. You can see that if you look at the cores, which are the CPUs, this is a six core, um, the cores and the cache together, which form the general purpose processing units, uh, are comprised about 72% of the real estate on the CPU. And then when you go to the next generation, the Ivy Bridge, you can see that the, uh, the cores are only about 47% of the area of the CPU. And then you go up here to the, um, the Broadwell processor, and all of a sudden the CPUs are only 20% of the <coughs> CPU. So, you, so what's happening is that we're still sort of chugging along with Moore's Law, putting more transistors in there, but we're not using those transistors for CPUs anymore. We're pretty much allowing the CPU architectures themselves to stagnate. Yeah, they're so, max out at some point. Yeah, I mean, you, most of you probably could tell. I mean, if you, bought a, if you buy a laptop today and you compare it to the performance of the one you bought five years ago, it's not, it's not that much different if you're just doing regular CPU stuff, right? right? So what's the rest of the stuff that they're putting on there? Well, Intel just labels it processor graphics, which is kind of vague, but uh, what it really is, is what we call domain-specific architectures. These are hardware that they put on that's not part of the CPU core, but it's circuits that are designed specifically to do only certain things really well, right? And they have a very specific type of programming model. So it's, it's, it's not this, like, like CPUs run any code, Intel CPUs are nice in the sense that you can run code that you wrote and compiled 40 years ago and it'll run just fine. They have this backwards compatibility. And not only that, but because of all the out of order execution on there, the CPUs will actually extract as much performance as they possibly can from that code, right? By, by re allowing instructions to cut in line and, and executing multiple instructions at one time and taking advantage of deep and complex memory hierarchies and that kind of stuff, right? So not only will it run code that was written 40 years ago, but it'll run it well, right? But you don't have that same kind of backwards compa compatibility with these domain-specific architectures. In fact, they change quite rapidly and quite significantly, and they're, they're difficult uh, to program, right? Did you have a question? Yeah, is it difficult? Yeah, yeah, these are, they, there's essentially GPUs, but they're not the same, they're not the same sort of architecture that an NVIDIA GPU has. Right. They, because they have not only, they're not only designed to do, uh, see, like, they're not just designed to do 3D uh, rendering, rasterization, but they can also do video encoding and decoding, and they have a, a variety of different, they're, they're usually split into different 
um, it's not just one GPU. There, there could be there could be six different processors in here that they just label as as uh, as, as, as uh, processor graphics, right? But they're all specialized for the types of things that that people want to do now, mostly um, you know video type so you, stuff. You guys remember when it was? I think when it first came out, it was called it was either it was I think it was Sandy Bridge was the first generation where they started doing this. Mm -hmm. It was a big yeah. thing in the news that all oh, the new Sandy Bridge chips. I think it was the second or third gen Core i series. I want to say uh, somewhere around there is where they started this, and it's keep you know kind of kept chugging along. And they keep they keep putting more and more. Notice also too that they the other thing they changed too is. Notice this part, it says system agent, display engine, and memory controller. They've brought the memory controller on, on board as well. And a lot of the I.O. control has, been come, is, has moved from being in the, the motherboard chipset, which they used to call the North Bridge. Uh, they moved a lot of that functionality into the CPU. Now, they still have a motherboard chipset that, that serves as the I.O. hub. But a lot of the, the high-speed I.O. is now moved on board as well, right, to speed up, speed up memory access and I.O. access. Uh, this same thing happens, uh, has been happening even longer in the embedded space, and it's even more important in the embedded space. This shows pictures of Apple. Now, Apple does not, Apple does not release their die photos. These photos were taken from a website called, um, I forget what's, uh, Wikichip? Wikichip. There's, there's a website called Wikichip, and they go in and they break apart an iPhone when it comes out, and they take a picture, and then they try to f figure out which things are on here. They try to guess as to wh what is where, but this, this information uh, is, is, is uh, secret. Um, but if you look at the way they've got these things labeled, I've, I've highlighted this, the, the, the white boxes are mine. I put the white boxes over where the CPU and the cache are. And you can see that going even as far back to the Apple A5, uh, the CPUs have always been a very small part of the chip. Most of the chip is in special purpose circuits, you know, domain specific architectures or accelerators or coprocessors, whatever you want to call them. The, the, the word nowadays is domain specific architectures, but we used to call them accelerators. These are, these are, this is, these are circuits designed to speed up specific tasks, right? So you see where I'm getting at here is that as time goes on, designing hardware to introduce no, new capabilities into devices, into products, is becoming uh, increasingly important and, and really critical. Because if all we had were CPUs, you'd never be able to do face uh, to do um, 4K video on a phone or or um, um, nice graphics or or. Uh, uh, you know, self-driving cars. None of that would be possible when, if we just were just relying on just software, right? It's all all that stuff is it's all solved by hardware. Um, so, what kind of what kind of accelerators do we have? Uh, a lot of this stuff is kind of a lot of this stuff is secret. Um, this 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 stuff is not really public. But for instance, the Qualcomm Snapdragon 835, which is a little outdated now. I think the eight, I think the latest one is the 855. Um, that one has uh, coprocessors or domain specific architectures for DSP which is digital signal processing which does their machine learning stuff uh, they have an audio processor a location processor a display and video processor camera processor security processor all that stuff is special purpose processors not run on the arm in fact the arm CPU does very little other than just run the operating system and most of the stuff you do on your phone is handled by these special purpose processors. The Apple A11 Bionic has um, a neural engine that can do 600 tera, tera operations per second, which is incredible. That's used for the face ID, the emojis and stuff. They have a GPU and they have a motion coprocessor which is used for the computational photography. So when you take a picture with an iPhone, it you know cleans up the picture, changes it. That's all done by this motion coprocessor. And then NVIDIA has, NVIDIA and, and many other companies now are coming out with these self-driving, they call them ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. I just call them self-driving car chips. But these are the chips that are supposed to drive the cars or warn the driver if, if someone steps out in front of the car, detects pedestrians and stuff like that, um, and does handles the intelligent cruise and lane departure and all that stuff. Um, NVIDIA has always been a GPU company. Right? They, 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 they made their bones with video games, right? But now, if you look at their self-driving car chip, which is the latest one's called the Xavier, they have GPU cores in it, obviously, and they have 
they have a CPU, but they also have this deep learning accelerator and this programmable vision accelerator, which are radically different architectures than the GPU that they became famous for. So these are very heterogeneous, even with a company that has this sort of purist <coughs> mindset like NVIDIA, that's all about the GPU. Yeah, and they've all, they don't make their own ARM. Apple makes their own ARM, but they, they, they conform to the ARM instruction set. Uh, and then in the data center, uh, you guys may or may not know this, but all the supercomputers these days all are, rely very heavily on GPUs uh, or the, um, the Intel Xeon Phi for a while, although that's kind of fallen out of style recently. But these are special purpose architectures essentially for doing linear algebra and uh, signal processing, right? Uh, now, uh, Google uses these, um, Google and other companies use the Tensor Processor Unit, which is a machine learning accelerator, and Intel just announced yesterday, uh, the 23rd, which is what, Friday, um, this, their new chip, the Nirvana, actually they have two of them. They have one that's designed for inference and another one for learning, uh, f yeah, for training. Uh, so. The, the, the idea of these special purpose architectures is, is, has permeated into desktop, embedded, data center, everything. Um, so why are these things, you might, you might be thinking, well, why is it that you can design a special purpose architecture and, and make it so much faster and better than a CPU? CPUs have been around for so long and the, the art of CPU design has kind of been perfected over the past you know, 50 years. Why, why are they so bad? Um, well, there's two problems. There's, there's, a, there's a memory wall and there's a power wall. The memory wall is, it, the problem with the memory wall is that RAM, uh, the, the RAM performance, the, 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 the bandwidth that you have between the CPU and the RAM is very often the bottleneck for your uh, computation. So no matter how good your CPU is, you're always limited by, not always, but very oftentimes limited by the RAM speed. And RAM speed does not uh, Im improve in its performance at nearly the rate that, that, that CPU uh, speed does. And, and the reason for that is because they're on different chips and they're separated by long wires that have a lot of capacitance and resistance and there's just no way to get around that unless you use superconductors or something, which is not possible. Um, so that's the memory wall. And then there's the power wall that says that there's this power envelope that says even if you use your whole CPU, uh, if you do that for a while, uh, it'll burn your legs off, right? If you got the laptop sitting on your legs, <coughs> or your laptop will shut down like Charles's does, <laughs> right? Because you can't, you cannot run a CPU at full at full bore for very long. It'll it'll overheat. The, the, there's this idea of dark silicon, meaning that you, there's you can you, there's 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 these thermal limits in place. Okay, so domain specific architectures get around these problems. How? Well, with the memory wall, they get around that because they use specialized memories that are on chip that are tailored for the application, right? So GPUs, for instance, have scratch pad memory and they've got register files that have 16,000 registers per core and they have no caches. They de-emphasize cache and they emphasize these special memories that are program controlled, right? Um, and they only, it only works well for certain applications. Uh, they're not general purpose. And the power wall is, they get around the power wall by eliminating all the overheads that you have in a CPU that are designed to allow them to execute general purpose code, meaning out of order execution, superscalar, branch prediction, speculative execution, uh, super advanced caches. All of that stuff is designed to, to extract performance out of any code, right? But if you're only designing an architecture that really can just, is only supposed to run one type of code, then you don't need all that stuff, right? So you, they're very lean and mean in that sense. GPUs can't even run an operating system. They don't even have the instructions needed to run an operating system. They have no timer interrupt on a GPU. You can't even load, they, they, every, everything you run on a GPU is bare metal, right? So, so that's how they get. That's how these things are getting around that. Okay, so that's my whole spiel on why hardware hardware design is is uh, important because I think the the field of hardware engineering jobs will um, uh, is 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 going to be growing uh, if we want to keep getting these new capabilities, or we can just stagnate and be stuck with 4K video forever, never go to 8K. 
All right, right now 8K video is impossible. Can't record 8K video. Um, There might be a, a, a cinema camera, like a, maybe one of the red cameras can do 8K, but that's going to be like a $100,000 camera, and, and that's, yeah, it's not really, I don't even know if they can do it, though. I think they do 6K. I don't think there's anything in the world that can, I'm not, I'd be surprised if there's any camera in the world that can record 8K video. I thought red might have had one, but maybe, maybe I missed I'll have to look it up. It was like, it was pretty expensive, though, like more than $50,000. Right. But if we ever want that on our phones or even in our TVs, um, we're going to need someone to, to, to design some circuits because it's not going to happen just through CPU evolution anymore or Moore's Law. Okay, um, Okay. so how do we design hardware? So um, this is a slide that every, that that's confuses everyone because I always expected that in 2.11 you guys would have um, done a lot of sort of manual circuit design, you know, just kind of pencil paper, and then implement those circuits on a breadboard with these TTL logic chips, right? That's how it used to be back in the day. I don't know if they do that anymore. What yes. We did for ours, I guess that was like three years ago. Uh, it was, our first one was implement a timer with a seven signal display. Seven, right? seven segment? Seven yeah. segment, yeah. And, uh, But 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 most of the logic for those was in the Arduino, right? You didn't design. We didn't, we didn't, yeah. Do, we didn't deal with like, any, like as far as like all your little drawings up top. We pretty much covered that for half the class and then implemented. Circuit. Yeah. See, when when I took it, um, you know, we we did the we did the you know Boolean logic and then we converted it to gates, yeah. uh, or we use Boolean logic or or K maps to minimize the gate level design. But ultimately, you get a gate level design, which then you have to assign each one of these gates in your design, you would have to assign to one of the slots on one of these chips. Each one of these chips has about eight slots on it. So like they have eight AND gates or eight OR gates. So you get the AND gate chip. If I want to put this AND gate down and then I assign this to slot one on here and the way I assigned it to slot one is I, I connected to the pins that corresponded to slot one on that chip and then I have to wire them, right? So this is one way to design circuits. Um, and this is the way that you're supposed to learn how to do it. Um, the problem is obviously that's not practical because um, modern CPUs have 250 million gates, and if you use breadboards, it would you'd have you'd need a, over a thousand miles of breadboards to to build a modern CPU, right? So that's not not scalable, right? Also, even if you could do that, um, the uh, the wiring and the you know the, the breadboards themselves, it, it would be really hard to, um, you know, if you made one mistake, the whole thing wouldn't work. You'd have to trace every wire. But also, um, what about reusing parts of it? Like obviously, Intel, when Intel comes out with the next generation of their architecture, how much of the how much are they reusing that they designed from the previous generation? Right, a lot of it is reused. I don't know what that percentage is, but. A lot of it, right? They're not going to redesign things that they don't necessarily want to optimize, right? So their floating point unit probably hasn't changed in several generations, right? Because floating point unit is floating point unit. There's not much you can, you know, not much you can do there. Um, so a big, a big uh, part of, of of digital design is design reuse and uh, debugging, right? That's a big part, and that's hard to do with breadboards. Um, so we're going to be using this concept of hardware description language which is how, this is how modern chips are designed. So we're going to be teaching you, you could literally take what you learn in this class and, and, and go to Apple and, and work on the next iPhone chip. I mean, this is, this is, this is how they do it. Um, the uh, hardware description language is a, is a language. It looks a lot like uh, any other high-level language, like Java or Python, but it's different in that it has concurrent semantics, meaning that instead of the program running from sort of in, in an order, in a program order, uh, every line of code executes concurrently, right? So the statements in your code, the order that you have the statements in your code don't really matter because each one of the statements in your code represents a circuit and circuits are concurrent. They're just all running at the same time. They don't, they don't, there's no ordering, right? There's no program order. There's no sort of, there's no, um, the only state 
is the state of the voltage on all your wires at any time, right? It's not like where the program counter is when executing your code, like it is in a regular program, right? So it's a different type of language. Um, in the book, they emphasize there's three concepts. Now this is kind of um, a little pie in the sky, but it's it's important, and it's, it's, I think it's important, it's because it's the way that we describe um, good design and how we're, how we're, what the advantage of these HDLs are. Um, abstraction, and they're all related, abstraction, hierarchy, and regularity. The idea is, is that um, abstraction is, is you only make something as complex as it needs to be because you build each level of your design by assembling simpler components together, right? Um, and that's kind of the same idea with hierarchy, right? A hierarchy is a design hierarchy where you have um, a more abstract module that's comprised of lower level modules, and those lower level modules are comprised of lower, lower still level modules, right? So most design that we do is from the bottom up. So you start, at, you start out by designing primitive pieces, primitive parts like uh, gates, logic gates, or flip-flops. And then from those flip-flops you design uh, registers or ALUs, right? And from those ALUs, then you can build, like, say, floating point ALUs. Uh, and then from those floating point U ALUs, you can design a SIMD unit, which then is part of a CPU, and that CPU is part of a multi core processor, and the multi core processor is part of something bigger, right? So there's this hierarchy. Um, regularity is the idea of you want to try to minimize the complexity of the underlying level. Now this is something that, this is something it really kind of takes skill to develop because when you start doing your designs in this class, you will probably try to put like the whole design in one module, one file, right? And you don't want to, it's better to try to build this hi hierarchically and try to, that makes your code easier to read and it makes it more, it makes it easier to reuse pieces that you've built for future designs. Does that make sense? So that's, those are the three concepts there. This is an example of a design hierarchy. So you can have a CPU comprised of processors. The processors are comprised of functional units and like a register file and maybe a control unit. And then if you drill down on a floating point functional unit, it may have a floating point adder inside of it. And the floating point adder, and you should know this from 212, is comprised of a comparator, a shifter, and a integer adder, right? And the comparator has a, has a subtractor inside of it, and the subtractor has an adder inside of it, and an adder is comprised of these like full adders, for instance, that are that are cascaded together. So this is kind of a kind of you know just simple example, toy example of a hierarchy. Okay, so now the the, the idea though is that if you have this high level language, hardware description language, you have to choose what you're targeting. What is the output? What is what are you going to compile to? In theory, and I don't know if anyone's ever done this, I bet someone has actually, you could write HDL and have it generate a design that you could build with these TTL chips on a breadboard, right? In other words, you could, you could take the high-level description and then have it compile it or synthesize it into like a step-by-step -step instruction on how to plug these things into the board and where to put the wires and then you'll have a working design, right? The problem with that, though, is that obviously assembling that is, um, is, is, is tough for a big design. Now, Charles actually found a YouTube video of a guy that I was pretty surprised. He, he, the guy actually makes these kind of scale designs at this scale, having this many chips, but he's much more careful about how he writes routes. He, he basically cuts every wire to be exactly the length it needs to be, and somehow he attaches the wires to the breadboard. I don't know if he does it with glue or tape or what he does, but that way the wires aren't fluffed out like a big rat's nest. They're kind of pushed up against the boards. So that makes it a little easier to trace the wires. But when you have a design like this, it's just hard to trace where the, you know, it's hard to fix, like, fix bugs. Ben, ben, ben Eater, yeah. right? Yeah, Ben Eater. Um, I, would, I would definitely recommend those videos, just, just like recommended viewing background material type stuff. Yeah, he builds, like, uh, he builds CPUs out of those TTL chips. The other, the other um, option you have, and I actually used to teach this when I taught 613, um, was uh, design for manufacturing, which is where you compile the HDL down into uh, a set of layers 
that form the masks that you would send out to a fabrication uh, facility to make a chip, to make a custom chip, uh, an ASIC, an application specific integrated circuit, right? And so if you do that, uh, you get these layouts that look like this. They look like polygons that are overlapping. These represent the different manufacturing steps when you make a chip. So you've got metal layers on top and then you've got a polysilicon layer and then you've got these active silicon layers that are, have uh, wells and diffusion areas and, and uh, a substrate. And um, so th these are, this is a picture of a layout and that's a bigger layout. This is a whole MIPS processor in one layout. This little square is the pad frame. This is where you, you bring wires out to uh, the edge of the chip so you can connect to the actual pins on the, the physical chip, right? And so the fabrication is, um, is pretty uh, involved. You start out with a silicon ingot, which is like a cylinder. Um, the modern ingots are, what is the die? Is it 12 inches or 16? What are they up to now? What's the diameter of a, of a wafer? I think it's, uh, they keep making it bigger as the processor. But, but imagine, I think, it's, I think they're 12 inches. So imagine this huge cylinder that's a one foot in diameter. It's a cylinder and it's, it's grown. It's a crystal. It's a silicon crystal. It's not like silicon dioxide that's on the beach. This is a pure, pure silicon crystal that's grown. And they make it out of this uh, cylinder and they slice it into these wafers, which are discs. And then they go through the, they, they go through the processing steps where they, they build the stuff on the wafers, which is mostly blasting in impurities in the silicon and then to create the transistors and then they put these, they pattern on these interconnects, the wires. And they do that through photolithography. It's essentially, it's basically photography where they, they shine uh, a light or electron beams through a photograph. Um, and then they test the wafer and they get rid of the ones that are bad and then ultimately they take these wafers and they slice them up into, into dyes. These are the chips that are actually get uh, shipped out, right? So that's, now the problem with this is that as, as Moore's law has continued, um, this has become really hard to do because the features on a modern chip have shrunk. They're down to like seven nanometers now, right? That is significantly smaller than the wavelength of light. And if you're, if you're opening in your mask, you're, if you take a picture and you've got something in your picture that's seven nanometers, a feature on your picture that's seven nanometers, that is impermeable. Light can't go through that because light, if, if your wavelength is longer than the opening, then it's opaque. You can't, the light won't go through. So. This has this is, uh, caused them to move to, they don't even, I don't think they don't use light anymore. They use some kind of um, high frequency beam that they send through. Uh, and also, the other problem is, is that when you get transistors that are that size, um, they stop obeying. Laws of physics. Yeah, well. Like at five nanometers, it's prescribed at like five nanometers, we're not getting like transistors operate and function properly right. because the electrical signal will jump through the wall of the transistor itself. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because you're talking about the, the atoms are like 0.1 nanometers spaced apart. And you're, so you're, you're making them small enough that you get into what they call deep submicron rules, which is the behavior of the transistors um, is kind of unpredictable and they have to reinvent the models the simulation models with every generation. They just don't scale them down like they did back in the, the, uh, the uh, lambda scaling days. So, and that started, by the way, at 100, 180 nanometer was when all that started. And then we got down to 90 nanometer and that's when things were got like, whoa, what's going on? And then now it's totally crazy. So what's happened is, is that the companies that would make these chips start, started going out of business one by one. And now, They've consolidated, I think there's only two places on earth that make chips. There's uh, TSMC and Intel. Like all of the global foundries and LSI Logic and all these companies that used to make these chips, they, they, they couldn't make them anymore. It just got so hard and expensive to do. Uh, now, now there's a lot of places that make chips that aren't at seven nanometers. They, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of companies that still fab out um, chips with large transistors, but when you're talking about ones that compete as in, in, you know, for the iPhone and Samsung and the, the really high speed logic stuff, there's very few companies that, that can make those. Um, however, there is a way 
that as a picture. Yeah, there's a picture of one of those wafers, and this is a this is a this is zoomed into the wafer. You can see where they're going to cut it apart. Cut it apart. By the way, the um, there's some weird economics with this too. Like the chips themselves have stayed more or less the same size for 40 years, because if you make them any bigger. Um, the probability of a failure on any one of those chips sort of asymptotically goes up, right? So you end up with this problem where if you go any bigger than whatever size they generally make, your yield goes down to the point where you stop getting enough chips to make it profitable. So that's why, you know, you, you might say, well, Moore's Law stops, just make bigger chips. It doesn't work that way because there's no way, that it, it has to do with the, you know, how many good ones you get out of there. And, uh, so those that have built Wait, but the thing I put in my motherboard, you know, it's this like massive silver thing that's like this big. Well, if you pull the silver heat spreader off the top, it's actually several of those wafers on one circuit. Yeah, that, that's the new trend too. Yeah, the way you get around the, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. The way you get around the yield problem is you do multi-chip modules. So, um, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work being done now in CAD tools, like how do you build really good multi-chip modules? You know, those really, those are not actually circuit boards. They're, um, they're not circuit boards because circuit boards have a, have a the, the, the material you make circuit boards out of has a, um, has a low dielectric constant. And so if you want to go really fast between these chips, you basically make a circuit board out of, it's, it has a, like a glass, like a silicon dioxide interior. But the problem is that they run into with that is that all of this stuff is highly secretive, so it's hard to build CAD tools to optimize the performance of chips that are from different vendors in one of these multi-chip modules. So that's always the, the thing that limits this stuff. But yeah, modern, a lot of modern CPUs are these multi-chip. Okay, so what, are the, what is the point of all this? Well, the point of this is that uh, the TTL chips are not practical because we want to build a whole CPU and you can't do a CPU on TTL chips practically. Uh, making a chip is also not practical because even though I can get a grant from Moses and we could fab out a half, um, a half micron, 500 nanometer chip, actually I think they do 180 nanometer now for free, there's a very long turnaround time to, by the time you send your design in to the time it comes back, you can't do that in one semester. It usually, when I did it in grad school, we did it, but we did it over the course of two semesters. Um, so, and also, um, that's tough. There's a lot of engineering work and there's a lot that can go wrong. So what we do in this class is we use field programmable gate arrays, which is a nice compromise. It's a programmable logic chip where uh, an FPGA is a chip that does nothing when you turn it on. It's a, it's a paperweight. It's useless. It's a blank slate. But then you can program it with a hardware design, a gate level design, and then you can put that design in the, in the FPGA and it will then behave like that. It will behave as though you had made a chip, right? The, it'll behave like the hardware that you designed. Now you might say, well, if that's the case, why is anyone making chips? Um, uh, there is a disadvantage to FPGAs versus ASICs. Um, an ASIC might have somewhere like, I forget where I got this number, I think I extrapolated I went to whatever the Intel processor was that was current, and I extrapolated um, the number of transistors to come up with the number of gates if they were all seven input gates. Because uh, um, a logic gate requires two times the number of inputs transistors, right? So a seven input gate would require 14 transistors. So you're, you're dividing by 14. So a modern chip might have 71 million of these equivalent gates. Whereas an FPGA, a big FPGA will have one million. So there's about a 50x reduction in the capacity of the chip by going to an FPGA. And the clock speed decreases by about a factor of 10. So a normal chip might be four gigahertz and an FPGA is, you're not gonna run an FPGA more than 400 megahertz, right? So you, you, you lose in performance, but you gain this uh, reprogrammability, right? Okay, so how does an FPGA work? Um, I'm not going to, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an evolution of programmable logic arrays. Did you guys cover PLAs in 211 a little bit? Okay, good. So PLAs are pretty, pretty neat. Um, they're very primitive though, and I always wondered why they still have PLAs. I was like, why would anyone use a PLA when you can use an FPGA? 
Um, I found out years, a couple years ago, my brother-in-law works for Michelin. He works in the plants where they make the big, the, the tires. And when they run those machines, the machines that run, the, the computers that run the machines that make the tires in Michelin are all controlled by PLAs, not FPGAs and not CPUs. Why? Because PLAs are reprogrammable, but you can also run them at like 50 volts which is a little bit better when you're talking to a you know, big machine than the little one volt FPGAs that we use. So they're higher voltage, right? Um, but anyway, PLAs are basically, um, the idea with a PLA is you have an array of, of, of AND gates and you can connect any of the inputs on any of the AND gates to any of the top level inputs, right? And then the AND gates feed into OR gates and then you can connect, you can make arbitrary connections there. So you can build a, a product of some circuit Right? Makes sense? Um, and FPGA is different. Uh, FPGA, instead of having AND gates and OR gates with, you know, shorting them together, um, they're built with LUTs, lookup tables. So every gate, an FPGA is comprised of reprogrammable gates, and each one of those gates is a little lookup table. So you literally just load the lookup table or the truth table of each gate you want into one of the lookup tables that are available. Right? And then those lookup tables, uh, so for example, like the gate input then would form the address of the table. So you're just looking up the entry. You know, you put the inputs in, in this case XYZ, I can put in 0, 1, 0. That looks up the entry 2 inside the table, which is 1, and so it'll output a 1. So it'll create an arbitrary Boolean function. And then those lookup tables are then connected arbitrarily through a, um, a, a uh, fabric, um, a programmable interconnect. Yes? How do you scale that to large number of inputs? Or do you not and you stick with like three or four? Uh, the imp well, the, the, each individual LUT um, is in modern FPGAs is seven, seven inputs. And then you'll have any, the one that we use in class has 115,000 of those. Um, big F, because we're using a small FPGA, the biggest ones have uh, millions of those, of those things. Um, when we run the software in this class uh, and you compile, the compilation time takes a lot longer than you're used to, like when you use GCC uh, or the Java, right? And you might be like, why am I waiting 15 minutes for this thing that's it's 100 lines of code and it's taken 15 minutes to compile, right? Why is it taking this long? And the reason is, is because it has to, part of the compilation process is it has to allocate thousands of these LUTs and connect them together, right? So you have to place and route. I'll talk, I'll, I have some slides, I'll show that in detail in a minute here. But yeah, it goes through a lot of steps, so it's slow. Okay, um, yeah, so, the, oh, also in, in addition to LUTs, I, I forgot to mention this, there's other things besides LUTs as well. They have um, RAMs, like just memory that they put in there, so you can have like on-chip memory, like if you want to make a cache, you can make a cache out of the memory. If you want to make a scratch pad, you can make a scratch pad. You want to make a buffer, you can make a buffer. You want to put uh, your bootloader on the chip in on-chip memory, you can use it for that. So you got that kind of stuff. And they also have things like hardware multipliers. And some FPGAs even have hardware floating point units. So when I say hardware, what I mean is, is that with an FPGA, you're making hardware, right? You're implementing hardware. but some of the hardware that you're putting on the FPGA is being built up from LUTs. You guys follow that? So I can make a, you guys are going to make a CPU, and that CPU is going to be physically implemented by programming the lookup tables to create a digital logic circuit that, that forms that CPU. We call that soft logic because it's logic, it's hardware, it's real hardware, but it's, it's built from LUTs, interconnected LUTs that are programmed, right? So once you program the FPGA, your FPGA, I'm sorry, your CPU springs into existence, essentially. It's born out of LUTs, right? And then once it's on there, it, it, it acts like a CPU as it, it, it does the same thing it would if you made a chip, right? Just runs a little slower, right? Um, on the other hand, there are some hardened IP blocks inside the FPGA, like multipliers, which you can make a multiplier out of LUTs, but it would be, it'd be kind of slow. 
and, and, and people need multipliers all the time, right? And it would also take up a lot of, lot of LUTs, right? So what they did is put these hardware multipliers on there so you can connect to them with your soft logic and they take up less space and they're faster. You got, does that make sense? So those things are kind of all incorporated into this grid of reprogrammable resources, right? Yes? So the multipliers are like ASICs? Yeah, they're, they're little ASICs that are embedded just in the memories are. And they have I.O. They also have high-speed serial. These I.O.B.s or I.O. buffers. So like if you want to connect your FPGA to your PCI Express bus, right, they use a specialized logic to go real, real fast. You know, they have fast communication, right, as well. Um, now you might say, well, do they have any analog stuff on FPGAs? No. No analog FPGAs. It's all digital. If you want analog, you got to go off chip, which is what we do on these boards. We have, if we want to go VGA, which is an analog signal, you, you go through, if you go through a, a, a di the digital to analog converter. Um, also, FPGAs are volatile, meaning that you program them, they work fine, but if you turn them off, they get cleared out, and you have to program them again when you power it back on. So every time you guys will notice, every time you power on these boards they go into like a demo mode where they start flashing and stuff. And all that flashing is being driven by the FPGA. Once you program the board, it starts doing what you want it to do. But then when you turn it off and turn it back on, it starts flashing again. And that's because the configuration for the flashing hardware is, is, on, a, is on a flash chip that gets loaded in every time you turn the board on. Charles figured out how to change that flash chip, right? Didn't you? Didn't you say you figured that out? You can you can change what's on the flash chip. No, I said maybe that. I shouldn't I shouldn't mention that. Yeah, I said I said I found the sources they used to generate it. That's how I got the LCD work. Oh, oh, okay. But I didn't figure out how to actually got it on the flash. I chip. had a, I had another grad student years ago that did figure out how to um, overwrite the the flash memory on these boards. So when you powered it up, it would come into whatever you had on there. But to be fair to me, I wasn't I, trying to. I I know, <laughs> I know, but I don't want to encourage you guys to do that because you know it's it's. You know, because that because otherwise, if you did do that and you turn the board on, you, you might think it's broken because it won't it won't do what it normally does. Yes. The tools we use cache like the compilation. So even if we turn it off and back on, it's quick to. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's a uh, the, when you compile, you get a a bitstream file. And the the okay. tools it's called a soft file. What's soft stand for? Do you remember? Serial something file. Probably serial object file. I would guess. So there's a soft file, and so. You can transfer the soft file to the FPGA in about 20 seconds. But if you want to change the soft file, you're, now you're waiting 20 minutes because you've got to go through the whole compilation. But that soft file will sit in your project directory on the server. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip through that, skip that. Okay, so this is the board we're using in class. This is the, um, we've been, this, this board is great because um, it's, it's got a lot of stuff on it. It's got a lot more stuff on it than any other board I've, I've seen. Like this, like this is nicer than like a Raspberry Pi because you've got all these peripherals that are kind of built onto it. It's also fairly durable. Um, I've had a few groups that got mad and uh, took out their frustrations on this thing, and they, they can be broken. Not easy, but I had a few guys that karate chopped these things and smashed through the uh, plexiglass there. Um, but uh, the best thing about these is that they've been making these boards for um, the company, it's a Taiwanese company that makes these, but they've been making these for, uh, God, I, I've been teaching this class with these boards for over 10 years, so it's been a while. And so that, it's nice because if they, if they discontinued these, we'd have to you know, re-engineer a lot of stuff. So it's, it's nice to have some, um, um, you know, keep using the same boards, get familiar with them. Um, and like I said too, they got like they got a lot of different switches and buttons and LCD and a lot of a lot of I/O. They've got audio, video, Ethernet, serial. They have um, GPIO connectors. They have high-speed mezzanine connectors. They've got um, uh, SMA connectors. These high-speed serial connectors. So they're they're nice boards, uh, and they've served us well. These uh, have a Cyclone 4 FPGA with 115,000 gates. It's a little bit old now. Um, but it's, you know, in this class, you're not going to use, you, you probably won't use, what, 10% of the chip, so. I think we usually, it's usually around 5,000-ish. Yeah. I feel like by the end of the course. 
So now I'm going to think about that though. I mean, if you're using 5,000 gates, if you did that with a breadboard like in 211, each one of the chips on the breadboard has four gates on it. So it would be 5,000, you'd, you'd have over 1,000 TTL chips to make the designs that we're making in this class. So that's why we call it advanced digital design. Okay, so um, let's see. So the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a process you have to go through um, that is called a design flow. Um, you start out by designing the system using primarily HDL and the, the, I'll get into, in the next lecture I'll get into a lot more details about HDL. There's two, the two most popular HDL languages are Verilog and VHDL. I used to teach VHDL in this class and then I switched to Verilog when I realized that Verilog seemed to be uh, more common in industry. I started, do, I started, at some point in my career, I started working more with industry. I worked with uh, Texas Instruments and this company called uh, Convey Computer, and just talking to their engineers, it seemed like they all used Verilog. So I'm like, why are we teaching VHDL if the companies are all using Verilog? So we switched to Verilog. Um, but they're both very similar. Uh, so you design it, you write the code, and then you you start out by simulating, or you should start out by simulating. Uh, simulating meaning that you, you test the code out in a virtual environment, right? Uh, and the way you do that is through like a waveform interface. You, you get like, um, you use a discrete event simulator and you know, you stimulate inputs with a test bench, a test harness, and then you evaluate the outputs to see if they match what you expect. Right? That's the simulation process. Once you're convinced your design works in simulation, then we want to move it into hardware. Um, now you expect that the hardware will work like it did in simulation, right? But that's not always the case. Unfortunately, ideally that's how it would work, but a lot of times you'll have a design that simulates okay but doesn't work in the hardware, which is, uh, which is uh, you know, that's kind of a worst case scenario. Um, but hopefully you catch all the bugs in simulation. Uh, then you synthesize it. That's when you convert the HDL into gates. That's pretty cool. I mean, you actually write text and it gets converted into a gate level design like you used in 211. It's not that practical though to look at it though because any sufficiently complex HDL will generate a gate level des design that's, that's impossible to read. I mean, it turns into like a big rat's nest of wire. It gets huge fast. You, you end up generating it and you just, it goes and you, you zoomed out to the point where it's just little dots connected with wires. So it's not always practical to look at your designs, but it, you know, you can't, sometimes it's, it's cool, but generally speaking, you don't look at them. Then you uh, map, which is where you convert the larger gates into smaller gates that actually are available to you on the FPGA. And then you place them, oh by the way, this is an NP complete problem. So the mapping process is just goes through a heuristic. Whoops. And oh. Oh, it turned off. Okay. Well, anyway, I don't need it. Um, so you go through the um, you go through the uh, um, um, synthesis process, which is like the compile. Uh, it converts your design into gates and wires, then the gates and wires get mapped onto the available resources, onto the available resource primitives, I should say, and then those primitives then have to be allocated to specific locations on the, on the chip, and, the, and it's laid out as a two-dimensional grid. So you have a 2D grid of gates, you have to choose which ones you want to use. It's just like in, uh, it's the same thing you would have done in 211 had they taught the course right and you had to actually put your designs in a TTL logic chip where you have to pick a slot. You have to say, here's a gate on that chip and I'm going to assign that gate on the chip to that gate in my design, right? So that's a placement problem. Then there's a mapping problem, which is you have to establish the connections to the gates uh, on the, through the, 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 the interconnect, the program, programmable interconnect. Um, and that's the, the mapping process. Um, so that stuff all takes time. And then once you're done with that, you convert the output to a soft file, as I mentioned earlier, and then that soft file gets burned, well, I say burned, but it's not a permanent process. It gets programmed onto the FPGA. And it's kind of cool because 
like I said, it's, 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 like seeing, it's like seeing hardware sort of materialize when you do this. You put on the FPGA and then it sort of comes into existence and it persists um, for as long as the FPGA is powered up. Okay, so uh, just, I'm gonna just run through this real fast because you don't really have to, obviously you guys are not gonna be implementing your own um, map, place, and route. These are, these are the tools that we give you are gonna provide this. But mapping, for instance, like if you have a function that has, uh, in this case, four inputs, but let's say we only have gates on the FPGA that have three inputs. So you have to take this and you have to convert it to uh, a, two, a two gate, right? So you had one gate originally, but we have to split it onto two gates. And then you have to choose where you want to put those gates and then you have to route them. So I have a, I have a concrete example here. So here's a, um, oh sorry, now let me skip through that. Yeah, here we go. So here's an example. This is a Verilog module that does a full adder. You guys, hopefully you guys covered full adders in 2.11. A full adder is just a, um, it's a one bit adder. It takes two, one, two bits and adds them. Part of that is uh, a sum that comes out and then there's a carry out, right? So this is the, the uh, you write this code in Verilog. We're gonna be learning this language. This gets converted into a, um, you know, well, it gets converted into Boolean algebra, but this would be the, the, the lookup table. Okay, so then, now, sorry, I, I wrote this out. I've um, been meaning to convert this to, uh, uh, I've been meaning to typeset this. I just haven't gotten around to it. But um, um, let's say, you know, this is a three input, right? There's two inputs and there's a carry in, and that produces a sum, right? So you can, you can take this through several steps of Boolean logic and what you end up with is you can decompose it into two steps. There's a, uh, you, you can take um, B and CN and produce S0, which is an intermediate signal, signal. And then S0 can then be fed into a second lookup table along with A to produce the final S. You guys, does it make sense? So what does this do? It takes one truth table that has eight rows and it converts it to two truth tables that have four rows each, right? That's really hard, to, that's hard to do, right? Because it's, I don't know how to do it, actually. This was, I, I did it through Boolean logic and I just sort of just did trial and error, right? It was like doing a, a proof. I just, I knew where I wanted to get and I tried several different things. So, you know, basically I did, I used the distributive property here and then over here, um, I took um, this other property that if I have ORD, if I have things ORD together, I can OR zero without making any difference, right? And if you take a signal and AND it with its inverse, that is guaranteed to give you a, a, a false, right? So I can OR not B and B, and I can OR not C in and C in without affecting this clause, right? And you might say, well, why in the world did you do that? Well, I did it so then I could apply the distributive law to decompose this back into the product of these two things. And then I used De Morgan's law for this to get this, and then I ended up with these two sub-expressions that were matching, which then I assigned to my S0. Make sense? So that was my intermediate state. But how I did, I don't, like I said, this was all just trial and error. The tools do this kind of just by guessing really fast. Whereas I did it just by, you know, well, same way, really, just trial and error. Um, okay, so then once you have these lookup tables, you have to decide where you want to put them in the grid, the FPGA grid. So in this case, I'm going to put this one here and that one there. And then once I do that, I have to form a connection between the output of this table and the input of this table, right? And that's done through this programmable fabric, which is all made up through transmission gates. A transmission gate is a way that you can, you have two transistors in parallel, and you can either short together two wires or disconnect them electronically, you know, through a voltage. Okay, so um, okay, so that gives you an idea of the, the, the process. So the last thing I want to talk about here is the labs. Uh, 15, 20, oh yeah, I've got about two minutes, good. Perfect. Oh, this worked out really well. Um, so we'll have, I mentioned we have six labs. Seventh one is for grad students. Um, the first lab we're gonna have you implement is another, I know you guys, you just mentioned you did a seven segment decoder in, in uh, 211. We're gonna do the HDL version of that. And um, we're going to, um, 
Yeah, we're going to do that, and there's going to be a little demo hello world that we're going to give you as well that's going to blink the LEDs. That's the first lab. Um, the second lab is a, uh, we're going to give you an ALU, and you're going to write the test bench for it. So we're going to give you an ALU, and there's, a, there's actually a bug in the ALU. It's a very subtle bug that we're hoping that you guys will be able to identify by writing a test bench. The third lab is a MIPS register file, and the register file is, is, um, the, the, is going to hold the registers that you guys learned about in 2.12, right, the MIPS registers, but with, with a register file and an ALU, you can actually build a little calculator with those two things together. So we're going to take the register file and make a stack, a hardware stack memory out of that register file and connect it to the ALU with a little controller and we're going to make a reverse Polish notation calculator with that that runs on the FPGA. So we're going to build a calculator and with pieces that we're eventually going to use to build a CPU. And then we're going to get into the uh, series of three labs where we incrementally build up a CPU having an increasing number of instructions. So we're going to start out with the R-type instructions, then the load store instructions, and the branch jump instructions. And then by that lab, by lab six, we'll have um, uh, a, a CPU that's Turing complete, meaning that it could it can do anything, it can run run any run any program that you can write. Uh, and then the seventh lab is the VLIW. Um, okay, so that's it. Any any questions?